We're here to talk about the future of, of Lyme and Lyme Mind. So uh, with me, I have Ben Nemzer, um, Dr. Brian Fallon, and Dr. John Alcott. Hi, thanks, Avi. Um, so today, my name is Ben Nemser, by the way, from the Stephen Alexander Cohen Foundation, uh, and I'm here with Dr. Brian Fallon from Columbia University and Dr. John Akat from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, so I just want to kind of talk to you guys about where you see the field going in the next five years or so. So maybe over to, uh, to Dr. Akat, where do you see Lyme research moving in the next five years, and, and what do you see are the, the major gaps? So yesterday, we had the scientific uh, meeting as part of the Lyme Mind, and what was amazing is the incredible amounts of research that are incorporating technology that's moving at you know, light speed and taking that technology and asking questions about Lyme disease. So where I see the field going forward is applications of, of, of technology that was developed in, in oncology and other infectious diseases and, and in other areas. So some examples that span everything from early diagnosis to diagnosis, treatment, prognosis, and I'll just kind of mention a few things. On early diagnosis, you know, we, we forget that a lot of people are still misdiagnosed with Lyme disease and that a lot of people don't get their rash seen or properly diagnosed. So an example of, of, that, of improving that actually we're working on here is using uh, computerized deep learning methods to recognize rashes taken on cell phones. Just the ability to diagnose on an app on your phone, the Lyme rash could prevent thousands of cases of undiagnosed Lyme disease. Once people are diagnosed and treated, Brian and I have a very acute um, desire to think about how to improve prognosis. How do we know who's gonna to respond to therapy and who isn't? And how do the diagnostic tests not only diagnose, but prognose? So Brian and I have worked on several things, and one of which we're really excited about is actually instruments, surveys that help survey patient symptoms and tell us not only about their Lyme disease, but how they're gonna to respond to therapy. For us, it's all about measuring. How do we know when somebody responds to therapy? So we've developed this GSQ survey to help understand response to treatment. And then finally, I'd like to highlight, um, Jason Bob talked a lot about some of the blood tests and, and technology there, but also there's other areas of technology that are rapidly expanding. And I think in the next five years, we're gonna see applications of neuroimaging. We've heard a lot about neurologic manifestations of tick-borne diseases, and there's gonna be some amazing work done in neuroimaging um, using technologies like PET imaging and other forms of MRI that are gonna really expand our ability to understand both diagnosis and response to the therapy. For me, I think it's going to be revolutions in measuring, measurement, both on blood and imaging and other things so that we can not only diagnose, but prognose and then know who needs further, further therapy. So it's an exciting time. I think there's a lot that's going to be happening. Great. Thanks so much. Um, over to you, Dr. Fallon. As a clinician and researcher, how can we help Lyme patients most over the next five years? No, I totally agree with what John was saying, is that we need to diagnose and prognose better. Um, so your question, Ben, as to how can we help patients most comes to that, which is, which is, first of all, we need to be able to identify who needs what treatment. So that's, that's called precision medicine. We need to be able to sort out those patients who present, let's say at the early stage of erythema migraines, who have a much more robust inflammatory response. Perhaps they need a different sort of treatment or more aggressive treatment than patients who have a milder, uh, more localized uh, presentation. With that knowledge, we can then design um, clinical trials. So we have before us, as a result of the great work being done all around the country by our colleagues um, at Hopkins and at Northeastern, um, at Stanford University, we have lots of uh, proposed agents that can be helpful for patients that can be put into animal trials as well as clinical trials and human clinical trials. And once we because we have all of these opportunities, some of these are already occurring. So right now we're doing a study of disulfiram to see how that works in helping humans who have persistent Lyme disease symptoms. But lots of other agents are out there that can be studied. We need to um, also start testing some of the different approaches that different clinicians are using in the community who have tons of experience. Uh, I've learned so much from these clinicians over the years and they, they've informed my research. And so we're hoping maybe at some point to have a clinical trials network that enable us to put all of these different, different um, 
methods and approaches, whether it's pulse therapy or, or a combination antibiotic therapy or non, non-antibiotic approaches for patients who have already gone through the gamut of, of antibiotics uh, to try to help people. So um, I think that's what we need to do to try to help patients most over the next five years, as well as to make it affordable because patients are spending way too much money on trying to get care um, and available. I mean, it's so, uh, you know, in the North, if you live in the Northeast, there are a lot of doctors out here, but around the country, there aren't that many. Oh, that's great. And, and so as we develop this, um, this research, I guess, question to you, Dr. Arcot, how do we make sure that this research is, is taken seriously? So, you know, when you're talking about uh, research, especially treatment research, it's just so important that you bring together experts from our top um, universities and that these experts really have the credentials or clinical trialists. They understand how to conduct big studies. And those studies need to incorporate community physicians and their experience, also the patient's experience, so that we know what symptoms and what outcomes are important to patients. Mm -hmm. But they need to be done in an environment of rigorous Mm -hmm. multi-center studies. And the reason for that is that um, no one investigator stands alone. We draw from each other. We learn from each other. And it's crucial that we have that collaboration among institutions. And then there's also um, the issue of geographic diversity right? New England's going to have different uh, strains of Borrelia and co-infections in the Mid-Atlantic than the upper Midwest and the West Coast. And so we, it's just crucial that you have multiple investigators that reflect that geographic diversity of tick-borne diseases. And those kind of studies done at multiple sites, though they have the academic cred to be published in the high-impact journals that will affect and really impact um, clinical care across the spectrum of physicians um, in the United States. And and the world looks to us, frankly, for leadership in this area. So it's not just the United States. You know, they're looking for us to to set the stage for for this kind of high quality research. No, that's great. Uh, Question for you, Dr. Fallon. When you have a patient with these persistent symptoms, how do you determine the optimal treatment strategy? And then how does that um, sort of impact the or inform your, your treatment trials? Well, that's such an important question, and it's one that all, all of us as clinicians uh, have to deal with. You have a patient who comes into your office, and they're, they might be have a mild illness. They might have a very severe illness. The illness might be of short duration. It might be a very long duration, lasting decades, perhaps. perhaps. So the first thing you want to do when you see these patients who have chronic persistent symptoms is get a good differential diagnosis. Take a fresh look at this patient. And don't, don't assume you know what this patient has just because what they're coming in telling you what they think they might have, but really explore. So for example, patients, many of the patients who come to see us at our second opinion at clinic at Columbia are coming with because they think or wonder or believe that they have a, tick, a tick-borne illness. And so we actually send out the um, tests to a variety of different labs because one lab may find one thing, another lab may find another uh, positive result. And we look for multiple infections, not just Borrelia pudorferi, but we also test for Bartonella. We test for Babesia and Anaplasma or Lichia. And more recently, we've been testing patients for Borrelia miyamotoi, which is a very interesting organism that unfortunately most clinicians are not testing for uh, in in the certainly in the northeast because in a sample of uh, I think it was 60 or 80 patients who we reported on recently only 25 only only two percent of those patients had ever been tested for Borrelia miyamotoi even though they had a tick like illness a Lyme like illness and that arose in a Lyme endemic area, and we know that Borrelia miyamotoi is located at least in the northeastern United States in the ticks um, in these areas, but only 2% of them had ever been tested for Borrelia miyamotoi. We found in our study that 25% of the patients tested positive on the antibody test for Borrelia miyamotoi. That gave the patients a lot of uh, who who had that result, that gave them confidence that, that they actually had had a tick-borne infection that was perhaps contributing to their symptoms, and maybe they needed an additional course of treatment relevant to that diagnosis. But we also know that not everything is um, 
persistent infection, even though we strongly believe and know that persistent infection is can be a major issue. There's also these other infections, Bartonella was mentioned earlier, that's a very important infection. But there's also immune abnormalities that arise from the, from the prior infection or from the antigenic stimulation that's on, ongoing. Um, we also know that the brain gets affected. The brain is in many ways the central computer of the body and processes everything. And, and uh, so the pain process there, sleep is, is controlled there, depression and mood and cognition. Pretty much all that we experience in our lives is processed uh, immediately through our brain. So we know that the brain metabolism and brain blood flow is adversely affected from our prior studies from Hopkins work. We know that there's inflammatory markers, microglial activation in the brain. So we know that brain circuitry and the brain pathways are involved. And so a good treatment approach would look at infection, would look at brain pathways, would consider the microbiome, look at immune abnormalities that may have arisen, as well as all the other systems of the body, such as endocrinologic changes or nutritional uh, issues. And finally, I know I'm talking too much, but finally, an integrated approach is really needed. So integrative medicine offers a lot in terms of a holistic model to healthcare for patients looking not just at the medical things, but also lifestyle, nutrition, environmental toxins, microbiome health, all that stuff. So we need a wide view on how to help these patients with chronic symptoms. Oh, that's great. So I want to kick over to, uh, to Q&A, um, if, if that's possible. Uh, Savi's giving me the, 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 no, the no sign. Uh, I would like to just like one, one last moment to, uh, to thank Savi. Kathy and Jason, the whole Mount Sinai team, you guys did a great job today uh, and yesterday uh, and, and the Time Center for putting on a, a great event.